It's a city within a city, an unmissable power hub, presenting Europe in Brussels. The institutions have three and a half million square meters of office and meeting space and 50,000 people working in them. A historian tells us how it all happened. Where to put the headquarters of the institutions was a prickly question from the word go, because each country had its own interests at heart, wanted to be host to a part of them, a slice of the pie, so to speak. When all was said and done, a compromise was found, sharing out the European institutions among three cities. Strasbourg for the full Parliament assemblies, Luxembourg for part of the Council of Ministers, a part of the Commission and part of the Parliament, so Luxembourg rather picked up the crumbs, and Brussels, which is the headquarters for the Commission, the Council and another part of the Parliament. The European Court of Justice also sits in Luxembourg. A veteran of the field who's been in the thick of things since the outset in 1958 bears witness to the rise of the Commission bastion, Berlaymont. The Commission's role is always to give the initiative, less to decide, except for domains in which it has real powers of management and decision, such as over policies of agriculture and competition. But as for the rest, it's appropriate that the Commission often plays more of a mediator role than a deciding role. There are two institutions which are legitimate for decision, the parliamentarians because they're elected, and the council because the member states have the right to be represented, to make their voices heard. This is what in jargon is known as the institutional triangle, three European institutions shuttling between compromise and power plays, right down to the very raising of the buildings. Berlaymont is first in the class as it was built first. When the Council of Ministers' Justice Lipsius building opposite went up, there was the question of not going higher than Berlaymont. You can see they are practically the same height on an equal footing because the Commission didn't want to be supplanted by the Council. That's how we have these two monoliths sort of face to face. The Justice Lipsius building is the Council of European Union's headquarters, also called Concilium or European Council. The Member States' leaders' summits are held here. It's here that Sarkozy, Mrs Merkel, Berlusconi and all the government chiefs, plus Barroso, the president of the commission, come to inform the media and therefore the public about what they've done in their celebrated summits. These meetings provide the impulse, and the heads of government understand more and more what Europe signifies, and with this, that all the decisions they take, even at home, stem from their dissemination in Europe, on the solidarity among Europeans, and so on. They're giving more and more importance to this, as the media are as well. It's always in these meetings here, though in terms of jurisprudence they're not real decisions, that the political things happen. The third institution is the Parliament, with 785 elected members, or 736 after June, providing a further democratic equilibrium. With the Council, it is a co-legislator, it has the last word on the community budget and acts as a political watchdog. Step inside. Here we are in the European Parliament's Brussels hemicycle. The members, MEPs, spend a lot of time in the European capital, Brussels, at least two weeks out of the month in parliamentary committee. One week is devoted essentially to meetings of the political groups to prepare ahead of the ultimate voting, which will take place during the plenary session. That full sitting does sometimes also take place in this chamber six times a year, but for the most part during one week per month in Strasbourg, the other European capital. Opinion surveys place the parliament first in the public's trust ahead of council and commission, but it bothers the public.
public too, having so much say in how they live their lives. Some 300 rule packages were passed in the outgoing five-year legislature. That's less than the previous one, but it still raises questions about how far the rulemaking should go. The temptation is evidently always to regulate. We control the controller, regulating that too, but it's certainly not a phenomenon of the parliament alone. It's a phenomenon that is part of our social structuring, and that has to be reviewed. More than half of all national laws now come out of the European process. It's not surprising then that everyone would want to promote his own interests in Brussels. Driving through the embassy neighbourhood, we see lobby groups galore. No organisation, region, industry association or union etc. wants to miss having its headquarters in Brussels. And they're still coming. It's beyond description, this world. The problem is to avoid these pressure groups becoming excessively powerful. As long as they're above board, well, their activity is permissible and legitimate. It's normal and even compulsory for Europe to know the opinions, interests and traditions as much of the member states as of the different organisms. There are some 15,000 interest representatives in Brussels. The European institutional quarter acts like a magnet for new construction. For many, the symbolism is concrete, 